Good afternoon, I'm Karen Holmes Ward. Massachusetts is struggling to house migrants seeking refuge. Nearly 1,400 families have applied for emergency shelter in Massachusetts since the state reached its shelter cap in early November. As our Sharon Sacchetti explains, a local church is stepping up to help families in need. Ernso Admiret and Michelin Jean-Louis arrived in Boston after the state's shelter cap was put in place. They didn't have anywhere to go. And they thought they were going to stay at the airport because they didn't have any other family or anyone else here in the Boston area. The family fled violence and instability in Haiti with three young children in tow. The best way they could do to protect their lives was to leave the country. They're one of eight families who found a temporary home in the former rectory and offices at the Bethel AME Church in Jamaica Plain. We asked, what can we do? And so we said, this used to be a house, let's make it a house again. There are bedrooms, bathrooms, a kitchen, even a playroom until the families can get back on their feet. Next month, they'll hold a job fair. The Immigrant Family Services Institute and the church teaming up with the city of Boston on the pilot program. We have teachers who come every morning to teach them English, to teach them computer. The kids have their playroom. Ernso has his work authorization and is applying for IT jobs, but he can do a lot of things. He said he's also a tailor and he He's the one who actually made the shirt that's on him. Yeah. Micheline is also looking for a job to support themselves and make room for the next family. So she wants to get her work authorization so she can work, and she says she really wants to be able to help and give back to others in the community. And the wait list for state shelters continues to grow as more families arrive. Joining us now from the Bethel AME Church is Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond, co-pastor, and Mark Germain, uh, the Bethel Migrant Neighbor Initiative Project Manager. How are you both? Doing Very well. good. Thank Thanks you for, for having us. Today. Mark, yeah. I'm going to start with you. How did the Bethel Migrant Neighbor Initiative start? Well, it started because, um, you know, throughout... Uh, the newspapers and just throughout our own networks, we were seeing and hearing about the great crisis that was happening. So many families were coming in, they were sleeping at the hospitals, they were sleeping at uh, public transit stations, and we as a faith community said, what can we do to help mm -hmm. to support these families? Pastor Ray, let me ask you, um, was this something that the congregation voted on uh, implementing? Uh, you know, how did the project get going? Well, this is for us uh, the continuation of something beginning back in 2016 when uh, we were part of a sanctuary network for people, many of them have been here for long periods of time, who were under threat of deportation. Uh, subsequent to that, we were able to help a family seeking asylum, um, a mother fleeing domestic violence with her two children. And so when this came up and uh, we realized we were not using that building very much, we said, let's make it a home again and welcome these families in. Talk about some of the other ways that your church community is supporting the families on a daily basis. So I think importantly, um, one of the things the church has been able to do is galvanize and tap into the local network. And so that's everything from helping families find jobs, uh, supporting uh, English classes, and all the other sort of uh, material supports needed, towels, you know, purchasing beds. I think through this effort, we've been able to catalyzed in a relatively short period of time, close to $15,000 to help families get the sort of supports that they need, and that's just the first step. Now, Mark, you have eight families living there? Correct, What's we have about 30 individuals living there. Wow, wow, wow. What's anticipated uh, for the length of stay in the rectory, and, and how long will the families be allowed to live there? Again, this is a pilot project being supported by the city. Um, as we are currently construing and thinking about it, this will be for a little bit less than a year. And really, the idea is to allow families to get on their feet. And what does that mean? That they are, get the skills that they need, able to find jobs, and able to move out to other housing that's uh, in, the, in the greater Boston area. Pastor Ray, let me ask you, this crisis mm -hmm. has been building for a, a few years now. Um, why did you and the congregation make the decision to, to revamp the rectory this year? You know, I think uh, for us the issue is that um, we have neighbors. They are our neighbors. Uh, an island over, a Caribbean sea away, uh, uh, or, or a continent over. They're our neighbors, and we know many of them are fleeing violence, they're fleeing war, they're fleeing disruption. I haven't encountered anybody who says, I wouldn't rather be at home where mm -hmm. my family is, where I've grown up, where I know the culture, but I can't do that safely right now. And so we've, um, as part of our faith, and this is true, I think, for the, the synagogues and the 
churches that have been a part of this, and we hope that'll be true for other faith-based communities and community organizations that will recognize uh, kind of the obligation to care for our neighbors when they're on, in distress like this. And you bring up um, the fact that there is a sanctuary uh, network. Uh, what are the, uh, the ways, Reverend, that you are calling on other institutions in the faith community to come together to help migrant families? Well, I think there are a range of things. <clears throat> Some uh, places have facilities that could be, that could house folks. Uh, we know there's some churches that have been helping when uh, people are in emergency shelter but can't remain there during the day. So they've opened their buildings up to allow them to not have to be on the streets until the shelter opens back up. Uh, and then they could support other churches. Uh, the best thing is we think is a partnership. Where we, it's not just on one group, but two or three institutions come together and mm -hmm. share the load. Mm -hmm. That's when I think you get the most effective response. And reach out to neighbors. Our neighbors have been amazing. In uh, We went to the neighborhood groups to let them know that this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And they said, not only do we not have any problem with this, tell us how we can help. How mm -hmm. are they helping? Donations, again, uh, volunteers who've dropped by. Mm -hmm. um, people have even tried to see if they might be able to provide jobs. We've had a mm -hmm. couple of neighbors who said, you know, we got some extra space. Maybe we could think about taking a family in, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, that um, folks have offered to um, work with young people, do reading groups with the young people, um, you know, help uh, if there's transportation needs. So families uh, in the community have been able to, have been willing to step up very important ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mark, we know the processing time for work authorization from the federal government is, can be a few months, can indeed, take a few months time. Indeed, indeed. Um, what are the families doing while they're waiting on uh, this clearance to come through? So one of the things that we have now is we have uh, English classes that are happening on a daily basis. We have technology classes. Um, we have conversation groups. Um, and what we've been trying to do is also acclimate them to the area so that they can hit the ground running once their work authorization comes in, so that they know how to use public transit, so that they have other relationships, so that once their work authorization comes to, that they're able to step into new jobs and really gain a level of self-sufficiency that we're all hoping for. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ray, the politics of migration often takes center stage uh, in this conversation, but how do you look at this from a humanitarian perspective? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. This, uh, and this is true throughout the nation's history, uh, the questions of immigration, migration, etc. Who belongs here, right, mm -hmm. has been a political football and demagogues have used it to great advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and we just keep asking people to think about the human dimension of this. Um, what would you want to be the case? And of course, as I say, for us in the, in the Christian community, in particular in this Christmas season, as we celebrate a, uh, a savior who had to go on the run to another country, Egypt, to be saved from mm -hmm. the threat of political violence in his homeland. Um, the, we're very clear about what the faith in our tradition requires of us, and that is um, to care for the stranger who is in our community and let them know you have a home here. Mm -hmm. And Mark, for you, separating out the politics from the humanitarian support. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think for me, uh, this is an extension of, I think, the great work that's been done in this country throughout every generation, in particular around the role of churches. In previous generations, it was addressing issues of youth violence. Um, it was addressing issues of violence in other parts of the world. And so to me, I think that this is incredibly important, and particularly as a Haitian American. Um, being someone who came to this country, my parents came uh, in university, they studied, but they came in a different generation. And for me, I think it's a blessing that myself and the call to action to many other um, in the Haitian diaspora community is what can we do to make sure that we open doors of opportunity, not just for Haitians that are arriving, but from those throughout Latin America, the Caribbean, and other parts of the world. All right, and Reverend uh, Hammond, the closing word to you. Any uh, words of encouragement for other faith institutions that might be listening? Yeah, we, we want to let you know that uh, the, the resources are there. Our experience has been that people will step up if you will be willing to be kind of the facilitator. Uh, build a partnership. If you can reach out to two or three other uh, faith-based institutions in your community, it's a much easier lift. And 
finding a good partner who can help you with the social services mm -hmm. and other things that are needed um, and, makes and all call, the difference. And call you and Mark. And absolutely. <laughs> if you, you guys know you how have, to make it happen. Have any yeah. questions. That's how we got started. The That's church right. out in Natick uh, helped us in okay. sort of thinking about it. It's all good. All right, Reverend Dr. Ray Hammond and Mark Jermaine, thank you both for joining us. Thank you.